Reality is the last nostalgia. We look upon it with hopeful sweetness, yet we grip it with the iron tenacity of desperation brought on by the terrifying accident of life. I wasn't really the type that would do the factory floor, mundane, same job every day. I found it all a bit boring. I tried it and I thought, no, I need something different. But at the same time, I want to work with my hands. We all needed to get a trade back in the late 70s. It was before the time of more or less CVs and computers and stuff. So my dad would actually drive me around to people he knew. And then my dad just happened to go to the stone yard. I think it was actually to order a stone for my grandfather and spoke to Michael Sheedy at the time, who was the stone cutter there, and said I, he was, that I was looking for an apprenticeship. So I started a six months trial course. And after six months, he said, okay, he was gonna take me on. And basically off I went from there and that was late 79. It was exciting to me, to be honest. One day I would be in the graveyard, the next day I'd be in the yard and I'd be carving letters. It was, it was a hard enough trade to be in on your body. It's a hard trade. We didn't really have all the breathable clothing like you have now. When, when you're younger, you don't really mind so much. You toughen up to it and it uh, makes you feel good. Stone carving was um, a very dusty situation. We were known as men of the dust. That was our nickname amongst the trades. We were generally just covered in dust all day long, every day. We were constantly covered in dust, but um, Everybody just got used to us looking like that. We were walking around like snowmen probably most of the time. I'm very privileged to have learned how to carve by hand. There's a great sense of achievement when you design something and when you actually carve it with your own hands. The art of actually designing something and drawing it by hand, cutting it by hand, all that seems to have disappeared a few years ago. So I thought I'd carry on carving by hand, even though I knew it's a lot harder that way and I wasn't gonna make as much money as anybody else, but it was the way I was taught and the way I feel it should be worked. At the end of the day, it's an art form, it's a craft. All you need is a hammer and a chisel and a piece of stone and there you, there you go, you know, so. So this is actually a form of exercise, which means I don't have to pay and go to a gym. <laughs> Perks of the job. Being around uh, debt and grieving, working in graveyards, churches, that's a learning process. Everybody grieves differently. I try to be very sympathetic as, as much as possible to everybody that uh, is a customer of mine here. People come to me um, because they know they can design something with me. People. People like to be engaged in the design of the piece that I'm going to work on. And I'll take them through that whole design uh, process from start to finish. We meet up several times during the, while the work is going on and they can chop and change a little as we go along as well. So. Terry, my, my friend, my neighbor, um, and he's my Buddhist teacher. Terry is a, a Buddhist monk. We're very good friends. We've known each other for about seven years, I think. It's hard to remember. 
My wife and I uh, were both practicing Buddhists. I'm a Buddhist priest. People ask me sometimes uh, what I believe, and I say I don't believe in belief. He began sitting in meditation with me on a weekly basis. Terry has taught me a lot about Buddhism and about life in general. I watched him working and at the extreme care that he uses, and I was very impressed. He was uh, commissioned to do a large sculpture for Bantry on the way into town as a seal, a baby seal and its mother. I trust his work. He's very steady. He's got a good imagination. You're in my blood like holy wine. You taste so bitter, so sweet. So uh, his good wife, Jane, uh, we lost her last year, sadly, through illness. We are now designing a memorial for Jane. I wanted a unique headstone for my wife. I'm having him carve a circle of stone, and I don't mean just like a wheel circle, but more like the rim of a wheel, so it's, the inside is hollow and empty. It would have her name and then her birth and death dates on that. And so you'd have a circle with this sort of block sitting in the middle of it. Once you're part of the place, by literally being buried in the soil, you're no longer blowing. Yes. And the fact that you're deceased has <laughs> yeah, something yeah, to do with that yeah, too, yeah. but you know, just as people might think of you. Yeah, true. And uh, I thought that was really moving, and she really liked that idea too, so. Good. Uh, all of it fits together in that sense. Well, one of the locals here told me, he said, you've got to be 10 years dead before you're a local here. <laughs> so <laughs> that will tell you what it takes. Yeah. yeah. I know it will be a very fitting memorial for her. Um, it's, a, it's a real honour to be asked to make that, to be honest. The future of stone carving is, is a difficult one. I think at this stage, I'm one of less than 10, 11 people in the country still carving stone by hand. It, it's quite sad to me that um, I don't have an apprentice. Well, I think once the crafts are gone, they're gone. And it becomes like the extinction of an animal or a species. Uh, once they're gone, they're not coming back. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that it will be kept alive, to be honest. I am not so sure there's life after death. I think people should slow down and be more mindful about what they do and what they do in this life. Time is short, life is short. What's really going to happen? What happens after death? Uh, nobody's come back to tell us, really. So. But I like to use the analogy of waves in the ocean. Um, all the waves are distinct from one another. When the wave crashed into, this, into the shore, where did it go? The ocean didn't diminish. The ocean was still there. And whatever energy created that individual wave disappeared and returned to the ocean. My wife used to say uh, in her last months when we knew things were taking a really bad turn, she was terminal, she would say, you know, I'm not afraid. I just love life so much. <laughs>